this edition of the Distinguished Speaker Seminar Series, hosted by the MPI for Developmental Biology and the FML in Tübingen. I'm excited today to introduce our speaker, uh, who is Professor Rolf Sommer, who leads the Department of Integrative Evolutionary Biology. This is a, a special talk that we are treated to today uh, because we will be taken behind the scenes to a field station that has been at the center of Ralph's department for more than a decade, and that of course is uh, Reunion Island. Um, we'll hear why Reunion has been such an exciting place to study Pristianca specificus, a model nematode in a department full of nematodes and nematode enthusiasts, but also how the island has changed over time from a geological standpoint, a biological one, and finally a cultural one. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Ralph and remind everyone that we do have a Q&A at the end of Ralph's talk, so do stick around. Ralph, whenever you're ready. All right, yeah, Hassan, thank you very much for this kind and nice introduction. And I would like to start out by thanking you, Honor, John, and Jeanette for really taking over the organization of our seminar series, changing things, moving the time from Wednesday to Friday. I think that was a, a wonderful idea and has given really a new energy to our seminar series. So thank you very much uh, for all of this. And I hope, of course, that in due time, we can go back to physical meetings in, uh, and lectures in our lecture hall. All right, so I will share screen now and... Hope that this will work. So now you should, not yet, but now we should be in real mode. Um, all right. Let's get started once this all works here. Oops. Ile de la Réunion or Reunion Island. I will take you on a journey to a European paradise in the Southern Hemisphere, some 9,300 kilometers or 11 flight hours away from Paris, which is still close with mostly four direct flights arriving and departing on a daily basis for business, for tourism, or just for meeting family. Some of you might know the island as a tourist attraction where you can hike in the massive Cirque de Mafat, a, Maf a Cirque without cars and streets, where you can see cows on meadows that look very much like ours, and where you can, after a long day of hiking or driving around the island, swim in the warm Indian Ocean year round. So this will be an unusual talk. Uh, as I said in my announcement, I will just very briefly touch on uh, small aspects of our research. These are the four uh, black areas here. And I will largely tell you about the life on the island itself, starting with the geology of the history and then some of the uh, more modern consequences of the culture that humans uh, have been uh, performing there. All right, but let's start with uh, some background on nematodes. So in my department, we work at the interface between developmental biology and evolutionary biology. And we do this with one particular group of animals, the nematodes or Fadenwürmer as we call them in German. And uh, nematodes are somewhat special because in contrast to many other animals, they are relatively small. So if they are not parasites, they are usually only one millimeter in length, sometimes even less. And that means they are not visible to the naked eye and many uh, normal people uh, that are not scientists and not biologists are not familiar with them. So the magic number in, uh, nemato uh, in nematology is 80 because it is becoming more and more clear that uh, the overwhelming majority of animals are nematodes. So there was a macroecological study published in Nature two years ago that uh, clearly indicated that they are the most abundant animals on Earth, with an estimated 80% of uh, all animal species belonging into this group. But not only 80% of the animal species, but also 80% of the animal individuals that live at any given time on our planet are thought to be nematodes. 
So they are the most dominant uh, component of the soil community with an estimated uh, four times 10 to the power of 20 individuals. That translates into 0.3 gigatons. And what was very surprising in this nature paper was that the highest abundance is, is, is in subarctic regions like the tundra and the boreal forest. So one of the huge problems in hematologies and a, and a real discrepancy is that while we believe that 80% of all animals are nematodes, only 25,000 of them are known to science. So we estimate the total number to be somewhere in the range of five to 10 million, but only a small fraction of the species are known. That means we miss lots of information about their biology, the biodiversity, and what they do really do physiologically uh, in their different uh, environments and ecological settings where they are found. So this is a situation that is fundamentally different from what we see in the insects. Uh, the insects are, of course, the second biggest group with more than 1 million species. More than 300,000 of them are beetles. I will come uh, to beetles uh, very soon. And in the beetles, the situation is not that we would know all species uh, and would have names for all of them, but we know an overwhelming majority of them and we can really judge their importance um, in any ecosystem service in nematodes that's fundamentally different simply because so many species are unknown. Given that there are so many nematodes, it's maybe not so surprising that some of them are wonderfully suited to do laboratory research. And our primary uh, workhorse uh, from the nematodes is Cenoobditis elegans, a species that has uh, a number of technical features that make it an attractive model system for uh, modern biology. There are basically three uh, important uh, advantages. First of all, the generation time is very short. It's only two and a half days at 25 degrees. So that means although we are dealing here with a multicellular organism, we can very easily culture it with very rapid generation times. These animals are self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. That means they are first for a very short time period in their late larval development, they are a male producing a limited number of sperm. And then when they become adult, they switch towards female and then they use their own sperm to fertilize the oocytes. That has important consequences and important advantages for genetic analysis because we can keep these cultures as genetically identical uh, organisms. And then lastly, um, we have very easy culture systems with monoxenic diet, and that is what you see here. So we have we culture them usually on six centimeter agar plates, and we only provide one food source, the bacterium Escherichia coli, that makes everything not only rapid, but also cheap and uh, easy to produce. As I told you at the beginning, in my group, we are evolutionary biologists, so we do not work on Cenoobditis elegans. We work with one uh, distantly, uh, not so distantly related uh, organism in an, of another family, and this species is called Pristionchus pacificus. And people, uh, we have good reasons to believe that these two lineages are separated for something like 100 million years. So uh, I will finish up this first part by giving you a little bit more overview on the biology of the organism, starting with the nematode life cycle. So the adult hermaphrodite will lay eggs. In the case of Pristionchus, this is around 150 under normal conditions. One peculiar thing is that the first larval stage will remain in the egg shell, so that the stage that really hatches out of the egg is the J2 larval stage. They will mold into a J3 larvae, a J4 larvae, and then back to adult. In in our species, it takes four days uh, to become adult under 20 degree normal culture conditions. And if you provide enough food, they will stay indefinitely in this direct cycle. However, if the conditions get harsh, higher temperature, low food conditions, high population density, then the organisms will early on in their life smell these bad upcoming conditions, and then they will go into an alternative uh, so-called dower larval stage, which is developmentally arrested and long-lived, so they can survive these harsh conditions. And whenever the conditions get better, they get out of this stage and start to reproduce again. So where do we find Pristionchus nematodes? You can find Pristionchus around the world in soil samples, but the most reliable source are scarab beetles. Um, scarab beetles are cock chavers, the mite caver, they are dung beetles, the mist caver, or stag beetles, the hirsch caver, and uh, you find uh, a huge variety of different species here. So um, 
As long as this beetle is alive and adult, uh, the nematodes will be in the arrested dower stage. They are not inside of the organisms. They instead stay on the surface in the folds of the cuticles, but usually in very, very low numbers. And it took really a long time to make this discovery. Previous nematologists has, have missed this. And it was only uh, Matthias Hermann, assistant in my uh, department, who has reliably been able to show that that this uh, association really exists. So um, what is happening when the insect dies? So the first of all, as I said, the dawa larvae fly around with the adult beetles. Then the beetles finally will die either in the soil or in dead wood. Then bacteria and fungi will start to grow on the carcass. The dawa larvae smell the availability of food, get out of dawa and start to reproduce. And uh, that can result in a situation like the one that you see here. This is um, an artificially killed cork shaver. And one week after, you see on that the plate is full with thousands of different worms. This is not only Pristioncus, this is also other nematodes. And uh, that means there's a lot of competition. And in the, in the context of this competition, Pristioncus seems to be a very smart guy because in addition to feeding on bacteria, it can also kill and subsequently consume uh, different uh, other nematode species. So this predation event and some uh, associated traits are heavily studied by uh, some of my former postdocs in their independent labs now. What uh, we are focusing on largely is the morphological features that enable the worms to undergo this, uh, to undertake these predatory events. And the morphological basis for this is the formation of teeth like denticles in their mouths. These such structures are absent from C. elegans and they are also absent from most other uh, nematodes. What we are particularly interested in in this context is that these uh, teeth occur in two distinct forms, in two alternative mouth forms. This is an example of developmental plasticity, and we are interested in understanding, first of all, the genetic and molecular basis basis of all of this and also the evolution and ecological significance of the developmental plasticity as a, a common evolutionary principle. So uh, let's finally say that while the nematode life cycle is very simple, the beetle life cycle that we have to consider, and I will return to this later on in the talk, the beetle life cycle is much more complex and much more long lasting. So while the adult beetles are very often short lived, the eggs, the grubs and the pupae that all live in the soil, uh, usually take several years to uh, go back to the adult to the adult uh, stage again. So um, I mentioned before uh, the stag beetle, Luxanus cervus, that we have here in Europe. Some of you might know them because they are really huge beetles. They have uh, a generation time of five to seven years. The beetle that you see here is a rhinoceros beetle that we will return to uh, from La Reunion Island. And although we are in the tropics here, this beetle still needs three to four years to uh, complete its life cycle. All right, so that was the introduction on the nematodes. Let's now do uh, some type of introduction to the uh, island itself and then move on to the geology. So here you see uh, a few from the north onto the island. This is Antony, the capital with the airport right next to it. And uh, let's first have some basic facts about the island. So the total surface is around 2,500 square kilometers. So roughly speaking, it's 50 kilometer by 50 kilometers. We had a population of 850,000 uh, two years ago in 2019. And what is special about Reunion is uh, that uh, we have a very well developed infrastructure because while we are in, um, in the Indian Ocean, we are dealing with a French overseas department, a so-called Département d'Outre-mer. There are five of these uh, Département d'Outre-mer and uh, La Réunion is population-wise by far the, uh, the, the, the biggest with nearly uh, one million people. So as I said, we are technically in the Indian Ocean, but formally here we are in Europe. And when you enter the first supermarket, uh, you see that you are in Europe and the Creole people are very, really French people. You have your wine for dinner, 
like you have it in the mainland, you have your baguette and you have your cheese. That is part of the uh, Creole culture on the island. And you do all of that, although it is really, really hot. So this gives you the temperature and rainfall averages for Saint-Denis, the capital in the north. So we are 21 degrees south. That means summer starts sometime in December and lasts until early March. You have moderate 25 degrees in Saint-Denis, but if you go a little bit more to the western side, uh, where you are really have more or less already desert situation, you can easily have 35 degrees or more. There is rainfall in the area of around 600 millimeters around uh, uh, all over the year. We will later on visit parts of the island more to the south, where you have 10 to 12 meters of rainfall um, a, a over average over a complete year. The best time to visit the island is the winter over there and our summer. So from May to July or August, the temperatures are down to 20 degrees and there's little rainfall. So everyone who uh, wants to visit the island uh, for tourism, uh, this is the recommended time period. So uh, I show you here a Google Earth picture uh, just for orientation because I will return to this uh, multiple times when I uh, talk about the different aspects. Unfortunately, this picture is now from the other side, from the south. So the, the uh, north that we have looked at before with Saint Denis, the capital and the airport are uh, here on the upper part. All right, so let's start now with the geology uh, of Reunion and the geology of the Mascarene Islands. Uh, so La Réunion is the youngest island in this island chain. And if you want to understand this complete process, we have to go back in time to the Triassic some 200 million years ago. So at that time, there were two continents on our planet, the northern continent, Laurasia, which is today's North America, Europe, and uh, northern Asia. And the southern continent uh, was called Gondwana. At this picture, it has already started to break up. This uh, breaking up of Gondwana took until 84 million years ago in several steps. And you can already here see what today is South America, Africa, Madagascar, India before it moved to the north and then Australia and um, and Antarctica. So this uh, breaking of Gondwana was a long process, but when we now look at the Indian Ocean from today's perspective, then we have remains of Gondwana still present and Added to this, we have novel islands that are the result of volcanic activity. So basically, there are three major Gondwana remains. One is Madagascar, which as a huge island is not of volcanic activity. Then the same with India and Sri Lanka. And then uh, what is often uh, not known to the general public is that the small Seychelles, a collection of 1,000 islands uh, with a total population of only 90,000 people, similar to Tübingen, that these Seychelles are all also a remain of Gondwana. That means they are not built uh, of volcanic activity, but they are of continental origin. Major volcanic activity between Asia and Africa started 66 million years ago. And as a result of these volcanic hotspots, uh, multiple islands have been formed depending on the sea level. Some of them are up and out. Others are below ground, uh, below sea level. and uh, one alien chain that is very well known are the Grand Comores with Mayotte. This uh, configuration is more than 10 million years old, but at the center of our discussion today, the Mascarene Islands are largely younger than that. So the oldest island is Rodrigue, thought to be 12 to 15 million years old. But I will focus on Mauritius, which is 8 to 10 million years, and Reunion, which is 2 to 3 million years old. So. With these numbers, it's clear La Réunion and Mauritius are related, but nonetheless, they are different and distinct, which is largely due to their different geological uh, histories. So it's not only the age that is different, but also when we look at the highest peaks and the highest mountains, we see substantial differences. So the highest mountain on Reunion, the Pitot de Neige, is 3,000 meters high, whereas on Mauritius, it's only 800 meters high. This is not so because there were no higher mountains, but this is so because the erosion after all of the rain over 8 million years has washed most of the stones back into the ocean. 
As a result of this, we have on Mauritius a very stable coral reef really around the island, which makes it a very attractive touristic place. You can also easily swim in Mauritius because there are no sharks coming uh, to the beaches simply because there are coral reefs. This situation is fundamentally different in Reunion because the coral reef is just building up. There are a couple of hundred meters, but it is not stable enough to keep the sharks away. And we have shark attacks every year and once in a while or at least every second year, people are really dying because of this. So given that the high altitude uh, is only present with steep hills on Reunion and not on Mauritius, Mauritius also has a higher population, nearly double that of, uh, of uh, La Réunion. And um, that is because the uh, island as it exists today can be used much more heavily for agriculture. So, our life on the island is between a container and field work, um, as uh, we normally go there in January. Actually, every year we go there in January for a one or two week field trip. We have started this in 2008 with a first exploratory trip. We had no clue if we would find anything of interest and if we would find something what we would find because it was a very young island and we had no previous um, information. We, it turned out then this, this was an exceptional trip and we made wonderful discoveries. We went back the next year just to confirm that we would find the same thing again, which is not always guaranteed in these type of settings. But when we could then really repeat everything, we um, asked the Max Planck Society for some additional funds, which we uh, have been uh, getting. And this allows us now to do in total 20 year field work, uh, which is supported by a, a lab container that uh, allows us to process material very easily. Uh, as evolutionary biologists, we of course had to do comparative visits to neighboring islands. So we have been to Mauritius, to Mayotte and to Seychelles. And it really turns out that Reunion is much, much more productive for us than any of the other islands. And this is largely so because it's younger. That means we are witnessing the events in a much, much earlier state. So this shows us um, at the opening of our container in 2010. This is uh, Matthias, my uh, assistant. Um, this is uh, us in front of the container, which was originally hosted uh, by, the in by the local insectarium. These are the staff members. This is our um, collaborator and by now long-term friend, uh, Jacques Rochard, who has been the director of this insectarium. So you might ask what does a small island need an insectarium for? So the purpose of this insectarium was to train kindergarten kids and elementary school and other students about the uniqueness of their island. So we are talking about a very small and very fragile island, which is full of endemism. I will come back to that later on. And you have to make young kids aware how unique this island is to really protect it and to make it uh, sustainable over long time periods. So this is our team, uh, the first round uh, team of postdocs when we uh, did population genetics work. I will briefly touch this later on. And this is the more recent crew that we more focus on ecological issues and the microbiome. All right, so the container is equipped with all of the basic things that we need to process nematodes. Um, as I said, we are there normally for up to two weeks. Generation time of the nematode is only four days. We have very hot climate. Therefore, we really have to process the material early to make it really ready that it can survive the trip to uh, Germany. So we have uh, basic facilities to even process material for uh, later DNA analysis. And uh, what that really means is we are in the lab uh, largely after breakfast all day to the late afternoon when we have to depart and spread out over the island. Uh, the distances can be quite huge. Uh, sometimes it takes us one and a half hour to come to our uh, collection site for the evening. That results in dinner being served uh, in the field uh, before we then finally spread out individually so that everyone gets his or her own uh, light set up because all of these beetles, the scarab beetles, will 
only be available for you at a light trap. So they are attracted by light. And when uh, at sunset around seven o'clock, we set everything up. It is fully dark around 7.30. And then we have a period of one and a half hours because scarab beetles stop flying at around nine. That means uh, everything uh, has to be very fast. So this is what we look out for. And this is one of the heroes in our system, the rhinoceros beetle, Oryctus barbonicus. And I will uh, later on return to this uh, beautiful organism. It is unique in particular on this meadow here. It is unique because we know from multi-year analysis that we have an infestation rate of more than 90%. So that means nine out of 10 beetles from that meadow will carry Pristeonchus pacificus. And that allows us really to do uh, very precise ecological experiments as you will see in a minute. All right, let's move on to the history of the island. So many islands all over the world were colonized by men early, if not even in prehistoric times. So Hawaii, for example, was colonized by Polynesians three to 400 Anno Domini, Madagascar around the year 800. The Easter Islands have been uh, colonized presumably much, much earlier. The situation in the Mascarene is completely different. So the Mascarene Islands together with the Christmas Islands are the most substantial tropical islands that were first visited by Western people. They arrived very late and when they arrived, they had paper and pencil ready to write things down. This does not mean that we have a, a full fleshed understanding of what happened in the early days, but we know much more than we know it for most other island systems. So um, the first one to arrive on the island were the Portuguese in the 16th century. The details of uh, this arrival have not been reported and they remain obscure. And that is largely because they had to keep this information confidential from their European competitors, the uh, Spaniards and the English and the Dutch. And it is thought that the Portuguese have arrived on Reunion in 1510 and on Mauritius in 1516. The first fully documented arrival was that of the Dutch sailors in 1598, and they arrived there with 13 ships. Imagine you are a Dutch sailor in 1598. You have been on a boat by wet, uh, in bad weather since your last landfall at the Cape. You are eating dry biscuits and suffering from scurvy. And suddenly your prayers have been answered. Land has been sighted. Up ahead is one of the mythical islands of the dodgy Portuguese maps that the captain boosted off. Cloud top mountains and sedu seducive forests promise fresh water and food. And as you land after negotiating the reefs, dinner walks up and asks to be eaten. Giant juicy tortoises, 10 times the size of anything seen in Europe and weird fat flightless birds that don't know how to run away. And now I was the fast welcome to Mauritius, a land untouched by man about to be changed forever. So uh, one thing that Mauritius and Reunion are of course most known for is the large uh, birds and reptiles that went extinct very, very early on. And the most famous of all is of course the dodo. Here you see a reconstruction of the dodo, uh, which is a pigeon that has only lived on Mauritius. There is another pigeon um, or related pigeon and related species on Rodrigue that is called a solitaire and uh, which also went extinct and both of these species have been flightless. On Reunion, there was also a solitaire, but this species is unrelated, has been an ibis, and it was not completely flightless. On Reunion, also these species disappeared and got extinct. The same is true for this tortoise that you see here. Um, but it is important in this context to consider that all of these were the first examples of extinctions. So when um, people realized uh, that these organisms were no longer there um, and uh, questions were raised, uh, one has to consider that the concept of extinction simply did not exist. So all of this happened before evolutionary theory, that means before Darwin and Wallace, and we were in a completely theological uh, worldview. 
Also, what made it even more complicated, um, Carl van Linne and the bionomical nomenclature of species names did not exist because it was only introduced in 1758. So that means the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, and the English gave completely different names to the same species. And therefore, it is still today very complicated to reconstruct all of these early events. So when people in Europe finally realized that the dodo that had been reported by the Dutch no longer existed on the island and that it was not found anywhere else, people really started to believe that this dodo had never existed. So in, it was only in the mid 19th century that people finally realized these people, uh, these organisms went extinct. So we believe today that the dodo went extinct around 1690 and the issue was only solved in 1865 when people found the first dodo bones and already a little bit more than a decade later, the first initiatives uh, were started to uh, have a law that would um, really try to protect these uh, indigenous land birds. So um, I finish up the history part by saying that the English and the French arrived in the 17th century. After the Napoleon War, both of the islands fell to the English. And uh, I should add here that there's not only confusion with regard to the species name, but also sometimes with regard to the names of the island. Uh, what we now call Mauritius has originally been called Ile de France and uh, La Réunion was originally named Ile de Bourbon after the royal uh, French family. So so um, after Napoleon, as I said, both islands fell to England, but in the Vienna Congress already, the English gave a reunion back to the French, simply because they didn't want to deal with the high uh, mountains and the, and the steep area, and they only maintained um, Mauritius where they could do agriculture. Um, Mauritius remained British until its independence in 1968. So, um, Let's move on to population genetics. I showed you now that we collect beetles, we have a lab container there, but why did we go there in the first place? So I keep this relatively short with only two slides. And what you see here is uh, our current Pristionchus phylogeny uh, and biogeography. This is after a most uh, recent paper that we have published earlier this year. And um, the species that we are largely focusing on is a species up here, Pristionchus pacificus. It is labeled with an H because it's a hermaphrodite. And that's, as I said at the beginning, it is first a male and then a female. This species is originally from Asia and is in an Asian clade surrounded by many other species which don't have an age. That means they are not propagating as self-fertilizing hermaphrodites. They are normal male-female species, so-called gonochorists. That means they propagate normally as we know it from most other animal species. Besides this Asian group, we have a North American clade, we have a European clade, and we have some other Asian clades as well. So um, we are by now uh, at around 50 species. And I should say this is largely the work of uh, Matthias over the last one and a half to nearly two decades, because when he started, we had around four or five species, and now we are nearly up to 50. The interesting thing is that in all of these clades, you have one hermaphrodite, sometimes two or three, but the overwhelming majority of species are so-called gonochorists. And these gonochorists are really restricted to these geographic areas as they are labeled here. The hermaphrodites, however, are largely all cosmopolitan, so you can find them all over the world. And we wanted to know how these very early species invasion events really work. How do they get from one place to the other? And we thought that this can best be done in an island system. And the younger the island, the better, so that we can really see the very early events in these uh, invasion processes. So now with the next slide, we move from a phylogenetic tree of species to a phylogenetic tree of strains. So this is actually a picture from 2008 when we uh, came back from our first visit. At that time, we had around 250 to 300 strains. By now, we have nearly 2,000. And all of them are strains of Pristionchus pacificus, and all of them could be, in theory, successfully uh, made it uh, with each other, and they would give viable progeny. Again, here we have different clades. We called them originally clade A, clade B, clade C, and clade D. 
And the very surprising and unexpected finding on reunion was that although this island is so young, it harbors the complete worldwide diversity of the species because everything that you see here in light green is from reunion. It then turned out why this is the case. It is the case because the nematode has arrived on the island at least four times independently with different carrier beetles. So some of these uh, beetles have evolved on the island. This rhinoceros beetle, uh, Oryctus borbonicus, is not found on Mauritius, but there are other related species. This is a flightless beetle from the Vulcano, which is also not found anywhere else. So these lineages are there for a long time on the island and you can see that most strains of these two clades are really restricted to reunion. The other uh, beetles um, have invaded the island much more recently and therefore um, you have these strains connected with strains from completely different areas. So we thought this is a wonderful setting and let's now investigate how these strains mix and how they copulate and generate new types of patterns and new types of adaptations. The big surprise was that we had to learn that there is little mixing and there's no pun mixes uh, between these different strains. So um, it took us a couple of years to figure this out and it took us really uh, around thousand strains to uh, arrive at this conclusion. So why do I mention this? I mentioned this because pun mixes is a general assumption in population genetics. So those of you that have uh, studied uh, population genetics uh, and know the Hardy-Weinberg law will know that this is the number one assumption is there is pun mixes, there's an equal chance of mixing. And also in our today's pandemic uh, with Corona, uh, this is important because many of the epidemiological models assume pun mixes to begin with. And we know, of course, that humans do not mix uh, equal. And uh, therefore, I would anticipate that once this pandemic is over, we will have a strong increase in research in primarily in the social sciences to understand how do humans really mix. And this might be really different in different countries and, of course, in the countryside and in big cities. So for us, that was a bit of a surprise. And we then stepped back and said, we presumably have to first better understand what the ecology of our nematodes are and what they do in these beetles. And it might very well be that the associations and the ecology of Pristeonchus is fundamentally different depending on which beetle we are talking about. And I will return to this later on. So a very brief section on what they are famous for. And this is largely, of course, and uh, I guess many of you know this, sugar, rum, and vanilla. So sugar cane was introduced in the mid 18th century. Um, it is by now being cultivated in lowlands and highlands, but originally it was only in the lowland. So sugar cane is a uh, grass. It takes even in the tropical setting of Reunion or Mauritius five years before it is ready to harvest. Um, as I said at the beginning, it was all in the lowland. Uh, by now they cultivate it up to thousand meters and even higher. So uh, most of the brown sugar that you will use uh, in your tea will most likely come from Reunion because we are technically in Europe. That means the Reunion's uh, sugarcane has the guaranteed uh, European uh, sugar price, which is substantially higher than the sugarcane price for the rest of the world. So the side product uh, is, of course, rum. And the Creoles on Reunion are world specialists in making rum varieties uh, on a theme. They use their uh, local fruits, passion fruits, fruit, um, bananas, uh, mango, whatever. And whenever you are invited by someone, you will get uh, a bottle of rum. And uh, they, I can just say they all taste beautifully. But uh, of course, they are the best known for the vanilla. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, very often, vanilla is referred to Bourbon vanilla, and that has to do with the story on the island. So vanilla um, is originally a Mexican orchid uh, and one of three species that are cultivated. Vanilla planifola is the most common one. The natural pollinators are bees and hummingbirds in the Mexican area, but the fruit setting is at very, very low percentage. So that means only one to 3% of the pollination events are really successful. And it was on Reunion Island in 1841 that a young slave uh, discovered that the plant could be hand pollinated. 
And this has then allowed the global cultivation uh, all over the planet. So the majority of the world's vanilla is really from uh, planifolia and uh, it is very often referred to then as bonbon vanilla. The biggest producers are Madagascar and Indonesia. And uh, it is really, once you have traveled all of these islands, uh, you can really taste the difference between the vanilla from the different islands, uh, from Reunion over Mauritius to, um, to Mayotte, uh, Madagascar, they are all a little bit different, but of course they all taste uh, very, very well. So let's from their plants and agriculture come to the modern life on the island. And um, again, some basic facts. As I said at the beginning, we had a population of 850,000 just two years ago. The projection is that by 2040, the latest, we will reach 1 million. The current GDP is around 20 billion euros. And unfortunately, we have one of the highest unemployment rates with nearly 25%. This number is from 2015. It goes up and down depending on what type of infrastructure projects are ongoing on the island. But it is also one of the basic facts that Reunion has one of the highest car densities in the world. Uh, relative to its population. And uh, this is just an example of a four lane freeway that was opened in 2009, the year after we had gone to the island for the first time. So in 2008, Matthias and I had to use the surface streets at the ocean to go from one place to the other. And that just took forever because there were traffic jams from the morning till the evening. And with this street now, our life is much, much easier. And we can, from the north, where we have often our hotel, to the south, can reach uh, these 60 kilometers or so within one and a half hours. So um, this is again to orient you. So this street that we have just seen is in this area. So we have a huge four lane freeway from Saint Denis in the north to Saint Pierre, which is the biggest city in the south. Then there is a smaller surface street, the N2 that goes around the southern part of the island. And then in the middle, we have the N3, which gives you a shortcut, but this area is heavily populated. And we come back to that in a minute. So one of our biggest problems uh, you see approaching here. So this is a picture that I took um, when landing a few years ago. Here you see parts of uh, Saint Denis. And uh, what we see here is the Rue du Littoral, which is surrounded by massive cliffs. So first of all, you see the traffic jams, although we have a four lane freeway. But the additional problem with the current Rue du Littoral is that these uh, cliffs uh, still produce many rockfalls. And although they are heavily protected and secured. We have uh, people dying on this freeway nearly every second year. And therefore, the uh, French government and the European Union have looked for a solution, and that is the novel Rue du Littoral, and that is building a massive freeway in the ocean. This project was started some uh, four or five years ago. It's close to uh, completion and I will show you a short movie. So if I can exit here, um, I show you a short movie so that you get an, a little bit an idea about the dimension um, of this project. So this bridge will connect Saint Denis, the capital, with the harbor town Le Port. It is around the 15 um, kilometer uh, area. It is a wonderful infrastructure project, um, gives lots of money to German and French engineers, also some jobs to the locals. And uh, we will see how life on the island continues afterwards. From an ecological perspective, it is of course a disaster, simply because at these cliffs, you have a unique ecosystem. So so there is a very high salinity, more than 1%, and many species of birds, of all type of invertebrates, of fungi, and of plants are unique, not to the island, but unique to these cliffs. And we will have to see and wait how the uh, formation of this bridge will affect all of this biodiversity. 
We now, of course, have to turn to the energy problem because this is, of course, the biggest problem on the island. So energy consumption increased by 40% since 2000. Uh, in 2017, we had a, around 3000 gigawatt hours. Um, the numbers that I'm uh, uh, showing you here are the official numbers of the government. Some of the NGOs give some different numbers, but the discrepancies are not too big. So by 2016, um, by 2016, 1,200 kiloton equivalent of oil were imported. So this kilotons of uh, oil equivalent is an official unit of energy. And of this, 70% were oil and gas and 30% was coal from South Africa. And all of this has been used to generate power. So most of the fuels go towards transportation, around 70% on the road, nearly 30% in the air. And uh, the only local energy sources they have are biomass, water, and the sun. And until recently, only hydropower has been used. But the local government uh, came up with a very ambitious project. And the idea is that by 2030, we are at a level of 100% renewable energy with a complicated mix, uh, which of course largely given the sunshine on the island has to depend on photovoltaic. Um, we still have a projection of an increase of the energy needed, but still um, there is a plan to make the island more sustainable. One project that has to be mentioned in this context is Takamaka. Takamaka is a place 800 meters high. It is one of the rainiest places uh, on earth with an average of seven meters of rain. Sometimes it can be much more. And already since 1968, there is a hydroelectric power station, uh, Takamaka 2, which um, uses the water falling down from 800 meters to 300. And uh, before there was so heavy um, need for electricity, this Takamaka 2 has served the island really very, very well. Um, if there's a Takamaka 2, there must be a Takamaka 1. This was already started before World War II, which shows you that the French have been uh, very active with uh, superb uh, infrastructural project and engineering projects on the island for quite some time. But at that time, we of course have to consider the weighing of interests. So uh, what we need is a substantial a sustainable food production so that we need less ships to bring material from Europe uh, to the island. And that should involve fruits, of course. Uh, we should just eat the local fruits and not the European apples. We should produce the milk with the cows on the island. And the same, of course, if possible, is true for the meat. And this is a weighing of interests because what you have to do in order to get there is you have to transform tropical habitats into farmland. So this is a picture from Plain de Cafre, where you see new agricultural land touching immediately to the rainforest area. So uh, the picture that I was showing you is in this area. So and the Plain de Cafre between 1200 and 1600 meters, people uh, are beginning massive farming. And we will see how that will uh, increase over the next couple of years and what the final consequences of this will all be, in particular, if we also will add photovoltaic uh, um, uh, settings uh, all over the island. So the last uh, part on the science, again, very, very short, digging, 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 and that is about the ecology of the worm. So as I told you uh, before, the scarab beetle life cycle is largely below ground. So um, for us then to understand what happens here and uh, exactly what happens after the beetles die has for a long time been completely out of our uh, uh, research possibilities. So a few years back, we started to um, use our rhinoceros beetle with its high infestation rate to catch it, kill it on the spot, and bring it back into cages filled with autoclaved soil. These cages are 15 by 15 by 15 centimeters with 27 subcompartments, one or two beetles in the middle, and then we put them back into the soil to, uh, and to then come back after different time periods and to see what's going on. So without going into any details here, we have learned that there was a surprising biphasic boom and bust dynamics. First, the dowers get out out, start to reproduce because there's plenty of bacteria. But uh, after a little while, the bacteria uh, are no longer that uh, frequent. Nematodes smell, there is no food.
food left, they go back into dawa, then the bacteria recover, the nematodes again get out of dawa and reproduce a second time. And after something like 10 to 12 weeks, the carcass is more or less not completely free of nematodes, but the biggest uh, boom and bust dynamics is over at that time. What we have learned, and that came as a very big surprise for nematology in general in this study is that these dawa larvae disperse much more rapidly than we had thought. So these containers, as I said, have 27 subcompartments. And after six weeks, we found nematodes in all of these 27 compartments exclusively in the dawa state. But uh, that tells us that they are traveling much more rapidly and faster than we had previously thought. So I finish up my talk uh, with a few minutes on weather, cyclones, and volcanic outbreak. And um, Cyclones are appearing irregularly. This year we were lucky, we had not a single one. Last year we were not so lucky, we had two within four or five days. And associated with the cyclones is of course lots of rain. So this year shows you a riverbed very close to one of our major sampling sites and you should be very careful with this because within minutes it can turn into a situation like this one. So um, to give you an impression on how these um, rainfall really is, I show you a small uh, movie from this year. As I said, this was not a cyclone. This was just a tropical depression. We had been on the freeway for more than an hour to really get to a place in the south that is known to be very rainy, but we still had hope. And at this time now, we really had hope. Fifteen minutes later, we left the freeway and we were on the surface streets. And uh, on the surface streets, you have small ravines that you have to uh, that you have to pass. And uh, one of these small ravines had just turned into a ranging river. And given that it was still raining and we had a three hour trip ahead of us to catch the beetles, we decided it's better if we turn around here and uh, um, do not uh, move on because it was completely unpredictable what would happen with this ravine. And people can get stuck um, for quite some time uh, because this heavy rainfall is very often unpredictable. So uh, I, of course, have to mention the volcanic activity because we are at a volcanic island. And to put things into perspective, let's start again with uh, Mauritius. So Mauritius, as I said uh, at the beginning, is uh, 8 to 10 million years old. It remained volcanically active until some 25,000 years ago. And that is although the island itself had drifted off the main magna source already for quite some time. On Reunion, um, the first eruption started uh, 3 million years ago. Some 200,000 years ago, the central massif of the Pitot de Neige um, totally erupted. So if you go back to our picture, so this here is the, the area the, with the Piton de Neige and the total eruption of this uh, magna uh, massif resulted in its uh, current configuration. Again, like on uh, Mauritius, you can have periods where you have volcanic activity at different places on the island. So while the Piton de Neige was still active, the new active volcano was already formed at the site called Piton de la Fornese. This is active for 380,000 years by now. And this is now in the southeastern part of the island. So most of the lava, uh, lava goes into the ocean and therefore the island is growing on this side while it is already shrinking on this side where um, we are technically already in a desert with a savannah palm area, which was not originally there. So the Piton de la Fonese is the second most active volcano in the world after the one from uh, Hawaii with 47 major eruptions since uh, 1950. So we were fortunate to uh, witness the yeah, not witness when it really happened, but we arrived for the first time on the island 10 months after the last major volcanic outbreak in April 2007. That is how it looked like uh, 10 months later. The locals had just uh, um, rebuilt the surface streets so that one can really enter this area. But although uh, it looks as if life would never return to this area, it was just a couple of years later that plants started to grow there again. And this is what is so special about volcanic islands. 
they are completely naked without any life at the beginning. And then some species arrive, plants, fungi, and animals. And these early invaders with little competition can evolve to form completely novel forms. This is called endemism, and we have extreme biodiversity and endemism on all of the islands in the Indian Ocean. And the first person to realize the extreme endemism on these islands was Alfred uh, Wallace in one of his early writings. So I finish up with two examples of this endemism, one from plants and then one from our beloved um, beetles. So we have all type of endemic plants on the island. One of the most famous ones is the Tamaradeo, an uh, acacia species called Acacia heterophylla because it had these heterophilic leaves. The closest relative to this bush or uh, tree is um, living in Hawaii. It was long, absolutely unclear how that arrived there, but presumably the seeds have been carried there by some uh, birds that are specifically associated with these trees. So uh, the last example, of course, must come from the scarab beetles, and I bring them from the Melodontids, the May beetles. So there are 19 species of, uh, of uh, Melodontids in the Muscarine Islands, four on Reunion, 12 on Mauritius, three on Rodrigue, and not a single species is shared between the islands. So some of them are closely related, but the moment a species would make it from Mauritius to Reunion, it has ample of time to diversify. And that is why island systems are so powerful systems for evolutionary biologists. But the story that I want to tell you is the story about an Melolonted beetle that was uh, until recently one of the rarest insects on earth. So Gymnogaster buftalma had only a less than 15 specimen collected between 1851 and 2018. And in 2019, we finally found the habitat where this um, species really lives. And when we found the habitat, it turned out this species is incredibly common. We can easily collect 100 specimen or more without really endangering the local population. So there are really thousands of these animals out there. And you see uh, how uh, important that was for uh, Matthias. So what he has here in his hands uh, is just part of the catch of one night. And that is the equivalent of what has been known before for the complete history of uh, zoology which, as far as this beetle is concerned. OK, I acknowledge our um, local authorities that make all of this possible. Parc de National, uh, Henri Agnon is uh, very helpful to us. Also the Office de National de Fourie. Uh, we have permits from them all the time. We of course also have a Nagoya permit. I want to and have to thank Matthias and Christian, our entomonematology crew. Jacques Rochard, our long-term friend and uh, collaborator who is a unique and outstanding naturalist and everything that we have discovered there would not have been possible without him because he knows every corner on the island and is really familiar with all plants and all animals. I want to thank all of the La Réunion team and of course uh, our administration because the costs associated with this cannot easily be booked through the SAP system and Jürgen Apfelbacher and his team have been uh, very helpful for making all of this possible. And I want to finish up by going back to this book uh, Lost Land of the Dodo that I have cited several times. So those that are really interested in, the, uh, in this topic should really uh, get this book by Anthony Cheek and Julian Hume. It had a wonderful description in Nature when it was originally published, and it's really a wonderful detailed account with all type of details. Um, this is a picture of Santini uh, in the evening. And as we always say at the end, bye bye La Réunion and see you next year. And I thank all of you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ralph, for the wonderful talk. Uh, the floor is open for questions. We'll start first with 